Greetings everyone and welcome to TNO, the last days of Europe, in which we're playing as Wales, the Welsh nation. Why are we playing the Welsh nation? Well, because I don't want to play anyone else. I want to draw Wales because we could have played as Ireland, we could have played as Scotland, but Wales? Why not? If you want to read about the, the information regarding Wales, go right ahead. Um, here's some more context for you. I, I'll be honest, as an American, I'm not sure what Wales even is. I know it's a small little nation, but Simru? Simru? Couldn't tell you what that means. We've got two research slots, and obviously this campaign is not going to last that long. I don't think it's very playable, apparently, because look at all the uh, stuff we don't have researched. So, we'll see what happens. Really, we're probably going to get destroyed in the war against England once the Civil War is over. For us, what are we going to choose here? I'll just strategic theater, because why not? We don't have the industry for tanks. Some civilian factories, maybe. There you go. Maybe add two more right there. We'll see what happens. We've got a whole one. Oh my gosh, just one military factory. Oh god, a free Wales, though. Wales is a young nation, but it is also an old country. As such, it has the privilege of dealing with problems that commonly afflict nations both young and old, such as the wild and often misguided actions of our political fringe and extremist youths. But there's also those with unfairly nostalgic view of the past, so they call themselves Unionists. Others call them traitors, and would see Wales return to a union with England and the rest of the Isles. There's no man better equipped to handle this precarious situation than our own Saunders Lewis. And ever since he became our Prime Minister, he has handled the problems with dignity and grace, but the wear and tear is starting to show, and whether his patience or his health catches up with him, first is yet to be seen. God willing, we should be able to resolve the looming crisis before them, because there's no telling if whoever comes next will have the ability to do so. But the good thing about Wales is their economy. Now look at that, minus 86, not bad, we're gonna slash, we're gonna spend more. Because I want to make and get some more political power. So, mods are using, obviously, our TNO last days of Europe. Uh, colored events, parallel peace conferences, which has no real effect on this mod, and... Stage test tool mod. Yeah, it's up here too. Cool. Not bad? Cool. And, yeah, I don't think Wales has that much content. On, like I said, we're probably going to get destroyed <laughs> by England. We're trying to make a division. I mean, our home guard is not terrible. It's only 8 combat with, though, so... We don't currently even have enough division to help hold the line against a potential invasion. So, let's go and train our soldiers, which probably isn't going to be great. Free Welsh Army. Uh, let's show you the National Spirits, too. So, we got National Spirit Welsh Culture, which looks pretty good. If you'd like to read about that, go right ahead. The Reich's Last Conquests. We have the Free Welsh Army, which hurts our army experience gain, unless or division organization. And, obviously, we have Austerity. Cool. Opening Parliament. Parliament will soon be in session, though this time it's a good deal more controversial than it has been in the past. Aside from a number of significant pieces of the legislature, they'll be present or presented to the Parliament when it opens. There's also the annual economic assessment to consider. The assessments managed to strike a delicate balance between incendiary and painfully dry, with Simru played receiving a great deal of frustration from the years of middling to weak economic growth. Regardless, the show must go on, and the show this is expected to be. It seems like the Parliament grows ever more stratified and less cooperative with every time it goes into session. And some are wondering if there's any hope to, that the parties emerge from this next one with national unity and cooperation in mind. We get the event opening of the Welsh National Assembly. Simru. I have no idea. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. Out of the ashes of the Second World War, the Welsh Dragon rose. When dust settled and the German Eagles took victorious for the first time in centuries, Wales was free. Unlike neighboring England, the Germans have no direct influence over Welsh politics, with the Welsh people content to be completely neutral. This neutrality comes at a cost, however. Welsh coal, the country's main export and the only thing keeping Germany at bay. It was largely due to this neutrality and their export-focused economy that Wales was able to ride out the economic crash of the 50s that crippled Germany. Despite this lack of outside influence, Welsh politics have become increasingly polarized over the previous decade and a half, and snow part, snow, no small part due to the multi, oh, what that? multitudinous English refugees who fled the German invasion, with the country split between those who look back fondly to the days when England and Wales were unified, and those who believe that Wales shall stay Welsh. Long live the Republic. Well, we'll see what happens. Followed up with the annual economic assessment. A time has come for the annual economic assessment. Gwenfor Evans, presumably after not finding anyone willing to pass it, pass it on to, has a dubious honor of presenting the assessment to all the parliaments and how they shall receive the news which will determine the party's economic platform moving into the years coming up, and Borman is named its successor. There's already whispers from the report carries a message that this is far from positive. While there hasn't been any outright decline in overall prosperity, imports have increased dramatically while exports have fallen in kind. Inflation is also looming throughout over the country as the drive to create a distinctly Welsh currency to replace the pound may have been somewhat overzealous as far as a nation as small as Wales. The job of telling the increasingly dysfunctional parliament this is as an unevian unenviable as any. The opening of the Welsh National Assembly. The air in Cardiff is filled with the hustle and bustle of a general sense of busyness. 
Today, even more so than most days, is for the opening of the Welsh National Assembly. The MPs have arrived, the speeches have been given, and behind closed doors, the battle for the future of Wales is about to begin. As battles go, this one isn't that much more civil than most. Wales' internal pol political situation is complicated, to say the least. The current ruling party is played Simru, leading a coalition of left and right-wing nationalists, including Simru Gosh, a democratic socialist and the second largest party in the nation. The coalition is only barely held together with many elements holding opposing views. Their ranks bolstered by the numerous English refugees that fled the German army during the Operation Sea Line were the Unionists, named after and characterized by their desire to return to the United Kingdom with England, as well as their wish to suppress Welsh culture in favor of English language and culture. They are also well known for their general disinterest in any government issues that do not affect them or England, preferring to stay on the sidelines of the Welsh National Assembly. Then there are the Free Wales Army, led by Julian K.O. Evans. This right-wing uh, nationalistic paramilitary organization vehemently opposes the Unionists and any idea of a union with England, viewing the English as the true enemies of the Welsh people. <laughs> Part of the coalition, they are notorious for their violent methods and clashes with the Unionists, and for the willingness to go to any lengths to achieve their goals, despite being publicly perceived as merely young, inexperienced, and quite unstable leader. Caio Evans is determined to keep Wales Welsh, and its charismatic personality and the fanatical devotion and military smite of the FWA mean he is not to be trifled with or dismissed without consequence. Let's get down to business and defeat the Huns. Alright. Welfare? Coal question? Rights of workers? Let's do welfare. One of the most controversial topics emerging from the assessment comes in the form of the welfare debate. Wales has a reasonably strong system of financial safety nets and government welfare, primarily supported by the Social Democrats with, within Plaid Simru. After seeing the stagnation of the national budget, hardlining right-wingers from the Plaid Simru have taken to roundly criticizing the programs and calling for austerity or even abolishment of the welfare state altogether. On the other hand, the left wing of the party insists that when times get tough, it's the poor and the working class that bear the brunt of the weight. With the solutions ranging from maintaining it to increasing their budgets, there has been a solid and cohesive development defense of the Welsh welfare in the face of this call against it. The Annual Economic Assessment. Well, Prime Minister Lewis, it's, time, it's that time of year again. Time for the Annual Economic Report. Sander Lewis sighs. He hates Economic Report Day. The gosh darn economists take away from his poetry. Go on then, Gwynfor. Let's hear it. Overall, the economy is doing pretty well. Coal exports to the Reich are up by 10% and exports to the English by 13 The agricultural sector is shrinking, but the growth in the coal mining industry well makes up for that. As well as you know, coal mining is by far the largest industry in the economy, providing the vast majority of the jobs in the country. There have been calls to decrease our economic, our economy's reliance on coal and open up the economy for new industries. And what do the mining firms think of that idea? Well, unsurprisingly, they are much more in favor of upholding the status quo. However, maybe prudent to hear out those who are calling to diversify the economy, since, well, if anything were to happen to the coal deposits, the results would be, well, catastrophic for the economy and Wales as a whole. But that'll never happen, right? Right, Evans? Right. And then we'll do the coal question. After the strange sounds that the Parliament held all throughout the assessment, a time has come to develop a plan that can get the Welsh economy back on track, something that the report stressed was that Wales as a nation is incredibly dependent on its coal exports. While this reliance doesn't seem to be a cause of the recent slowing of Welsh economic growth, there are those who are thinking that this reliance makes the economy entirely too fragile. After all, should something happen to, e to either disrupt Wales' ability to acquire its coal, or should coal fall even further out of international favour than it already has, the results would be devastating. There are those who argue otherwise, though. The fact that Wales lives and dies by its coal exports is not new information, that there is nothing to rely from relying on coal. The argument goes that leaning so heavily on the export of coal gives Wales a kind of strength, not fragility, that ensures that they won't be investing in any overly optimistic or ambitious investments that could ruin them in the turn. Oh man, that is... I don't know, it's always good to diversify your portfolio. It's always good. At least a little bit of uh, divestment into other types of investments. So, another unremarkable grey day. The Welsh Assembly convened to discuss the government's welfare policy. The debate was not expected to go smoothly for the National Front. Quiet anticipation filled the chamber as a Gawk member stood up to introduce his party's motion. I wish to make it known to the Assembly that the Gawk approves the achievements of the National Front concerning improvements in the development of the welfare safety net. Those who are part of the Gawk and also wish to also wish that the government will continue to increase its scale to better protect Welsh workers from poverty. This was a poor display of feigned unity over the government's welfare policy. In reality, the division on the issues are deep and neither side is keen to fold to the other. This was made clear to all inside the assembly as, as a member of the plate stood up to address the point made by the Gawk. Whilst the view of the Gawk is admirable, it is infeasible within our current economy. Simply put, the country does not have the money for such an irresponsible expansion. In fact, it does not even have the money to support the current system. Barely stifled outrage came from the Gawk as he realized what the play was pushing for. Regardless of these differences, one side would have to blink first. The welfare system had to be changed. What were they, were they ever get along? Right now, with the current poverty rate, it's slowly improving by 1.5 every month. We only have a quarter to half our population in poverty, so not great, but not bad. Uh, in addition to our academic base is going up by 0.75, and the other one that's only going up is industrial expertise by 1.25 every month. So it is what it is. So we could do either scale it down, welfare cuts, give us more money, 
monthly poverty change goes down, but we're still okay. We'd still be okay. Or we do the war on poverty. Expansion welfare. We get no we go from no employment subs no unemployment subsidies to drinking uh, unemployment subsidies. You get more stability, you get some more costs though, and poverty doesn't change honestly by that much. 0.25 where we're going to be going, it's probably not even going to be worth it, so let's scale it down. Because I like money. After what practically amounted to a small war in the parliament, the bruised egos and slowly prides finally gave way to a narrow victory in favor of austerity. While the resistance was spirited and prevented any sort of truly drastic measure from being taken, there are now plans to reduce the government spending on its social programs. The easiest way to do this is to narrow the scope and availability. This will allow well to take care of those truly in need while not wasting precious resources on those who can preferably or probably get by without it. People will grumble if they must, but they'll have forgotten all about it in a few months' time or will reap the benefits. The cold debate. It's completely obvious that the economy is too reliant on the coal exports. Were anything to happen to coal, we would face an enormous catastrophe. We need diversifying it. We need to open up the economy to resounding eyes from inside of the room. The Gok MP takes his seat. The economy in question, an issue that splits the government. Many in the government believe that the Welsh economy's reliance on coal is a rather critical weak point, and that the economy needs to be opened up for other industries to sprout up. On the other side are those that believe otherwise, seeing that the reliance on coal as an indication that coal is still the way forward for Wales. The played MP rises to the podium to begin his rebuttal. With respect to the Honourable Mr. Davies, this is a ridiculous notion. There are, there's no evidence that anything will happen that couldn't cause the coal industry to weaken at all. In fact, there's an abundant amount of evidence. To the contrary, the coal industry has never been stronger. Any sort of changes would simply affect the whole economy adversely. I have no idea where that voice or sound came out of, or what, what that was. The government will decide. Let, let the government decide. We're gonna scale it down, sons. And with no events. I don't know, I'm, I'm pretty sure we're not supposed to be playing whales. <laughs> oh my goodness, but I'm, I'm going to enjoy this no matter what. Yeah, I just don't want to play Germany at the time of this recording. Didn't feel like playing Germany, didn't feel like playing Ireland or Scotland like I said earlier. Uh, I kind of want to play Italy, but I heard the localization still isn't good. Also, I didn't, let you, I didn't tell you guys, but I'm currently playing as whales on patch cutting floor room patch E. So, pretty, pretty good. Ooh, improve. Opening up more economic policies will improve our GDP growth. Oh, I like growth. All in on coal, though. Uh, I think diversifying the economy would probably be best, though. After a long and drawn-out debate, the faction of Parliament in favor of diversification managed to win out and adopt their stance into official national policy. Well, it's clear that there's going to need to be some momentary sacrifices as government subsidization and sponsorship of coal mining is reduced to make way for other industries. It's pretty clear that the long-term benefits will be worth the cost. If we survive! The math is simple. For a while, coal might work as a pillar of Welsh industry. Now, what might the situation look like in five years' time? Ten years? Twenty? Diversification will allow us to remain flexible and adjust as needed in order to keep price or pace with the world at large. Wales needs to keep with the times if she's to avoid becoming a total economic backwater. But now, time for welfare cuts. There's been a mistake. They have, they, they, they have to have made a mistake. Roberts repeated himself as he stared blankly down his welfare payment, which, to his horror, already greatly greatly shrunk since the last time he received it. His hands trembled slightly as it, he desperately started to count it again in the hope that it was in fact who had faltered. But he soon realized that he was right. Life kept getting worse for him. Things had not always been this way for Robert since being sacked from his last job. He, like the rest of his co-workers, expected that he would not be on the door for long. He planned to find a job after a few weeks of recovery. Once he had sorted out his life, he could return to work, whether it be in an office, production line, or a pit. However, over time, no such opportunity arose. He began to get used to the meager life that his benefits allowed. To save what patience he had was not an option, despite the fact he desperately needed some savings in case his financial situation somewhat deteriorated further. Now is the time he needs money, money that he never had. Now it feels as if he has been left behind to slowly be blood dry of his remaining wealth until he gets lucky and finds a way out, though he does not know how he could escape. The poor get poor. My apologies, but it is what it is. 4.75 is still going up. It's still going up. Green arrow go up makes me happy. Red arrow goes down, doesn't make me happy. I don't know, I just click buttons in a game. Backlash against the cuts after sauntering out of his gently decaying home. Robert started to make the all-too-familiar journey towards the local council. Every week he would wait on the roadside, killing time to meet a civil servant who would supposedly help him find a job. What did that... What did, what did they care about him? They had a job for life in the council, a warm office to work in, and a reasonable house to return to. They had everything that he wanted. All they did was stay inside and force him to spend another wasted day waiting. This time he was not going to wait. He would go in and get his money back himself. Robert turned the corner of the council and realized the situation was not unique. A mob was slowly forming outside the council. It was pounded, pounded on the doors, shouted and howled, demanding to be let in and paid for what he was still owed to them in full. Well, the people inside the locked doors did not care. They carried on doing their jobs. Happy to remain ignorant of the crowd outside that would eventually be dispersed. They're going to have to accept it soon. And maybe we'll find more things about it. But hey, look at that! We got extra money! Ah, uh, I love it. 1.38 billion. Not great, but hey, I'll take it. 
I'll gladly take it. The Afaban disaster, though, around 10.40 a.m. this morning. Tragedy struck the southern coal mining town of Abafan. As a result of heavy rains, a large spoil tip full of waste rock located on the mountainside suddenly collapsed and began sliding down the slopes as a heavy slurry of stone and mud. The gigantic landslide careened down the mountain and engulfed a significant portion of the village, destroying dozens of homes and most distressingly of all, the local school. Oh no, not the education system! Desperate rescue teams have been attempting to look for survivors, but scores of bodies have already been recovered from the ruins, the vast majority of them being children. Uh oh. Over a hundred pupils and several dozen teachers were in the school at the time of the disaster, so the ultimate death toll is expected to be very grim indeed. A few older residents were also recovered from the collapsed houses, though most people were thankfully away at work at the time. This is why you need child labor, so that way you can put the children in the school so there's not a, like a mudslide or landslide that could kill them. Just saying, you know. Sorry, I played too much Vicky too. Child labor is too much fun. Outrage just quickly spread across Wales, with many blaming the government's exploitative coal mine policies and lax regulations for the disasters. Questions have been raised as to how the spoil tip was allowed to grow so large in the precarious place, and a particular criticism has been leveled at Economic Minister Gwynfor Evans and his secretary Roderick Bowen for creating such a loose regulatory environment that would allow for such a thing to, like this to happen. The fallout from the Aberdeen fall or disaster uh, has been Aberfan disasters, but the already weakened government on even more of a nice edge. Horrible, absolutely horrible. But the rights of workers. Normally, when the rights of the working man comes to the attending to the attention of the governments and the legislatures, it comes from the working members themselves demanding better pay, shorter hours, or better working conditions. This time, however, it's different. Wales' industry and market is relatively new, at least at its own, rather than a subsidiary of a larger economy. And many small new businesses are struggling to get on their feet. They blame labor laws and regulations that were instated upon the founding of the Welsh nation. They argue that they won't be able to keep up with a much larger and wealthy foreign nations, and that Welsh finance could perish in its infancy if there isn't take action taken in soon. They want a general rolling back. Of some of the regulations, primarily in the terms of labor rights and safety regulations, in order to give Welsh companies a leg up. This, of course, is a controversial suggestion in Parliament, unspeakable to the left faction of the plague sim room. And now for something different, perhaps? A change in course, reads the headlines of the newspaper. After a vote in Parliament, the government has decided to open up the economy in order to allow new industries to develop. This comes as a surprise to many in the country who believed that the government wouldn't approve anything that could threaten the primacy of the coal industry. This controversial decision soon comes after a heated debate in the Parliament about said issue. Many Parliament members have called the issue outrageous and ridiculous, stating that the coal industry has never been stronger and that any changes to the status quo could upset the economic environment. Owen Morgan smiles. Turning the page, it would seem that they were finally seeing more sense and shifting the focus on coal exports. Maybe it would be such a bad time to follow up on his plans to start a new business or now that new industries and ventures could be successful. Of course, it would be rather risky than just investing in coal, but fortune favors the bold, as his fathers always used to say about him. About gosh darn time. Do we have more money yet? No, we don't. That sucks. Actually, we could probably invest more. You know what? We could probably. We're going to invest more construction. We might have a budget. Span. Oh, we're still doing great. Wow, look at the GDP growth. 13%. Oh, I love slashing stuff. We can actually maybe build something. It's going to be done in 1966, though. The Workers' Rights Charter. More safety regulations, less cap, more population. This will work out. Or remove the red tape. So we get less monthly population, more efficiency cap. That's less, more. Improve our GDP growth? I like growth. Oh, I like growth a lot. But on the subject of labor regulations, the workers need more protections. Currently, there's nothing stopping businesses from exploiting their workers. No one here can say in good conscience that this is acceptable. The Gawk MP's words echo throughout the halls he pauses for returning to a seat. Labor regulations. A subject no less contentious in the cold debate. The Gawk's position is made very clear the workers of Wales are unprotected and open to exploitation, and this is unacceptable. The plate is somewhat less unified on the matter, but many of the members agree that any changes could in injure the large businesses in the country and even cause them to withdraw their business. Do the Honorable Mr. Davies starts a plate MP, any increase in regulatory measures implemented by the government would adversely affect the whole economy by forcing cooperations or corporations to bend to these unnecessary regulations. Growth will be stacked up or little to no actual gain. The workers are what matter. I kind of like this one. I like our workers' rights charter. Scale it down, war and poverty. But we've already diversified the economy. We're scaling it down. And if we get GDP growth, I'm so tempted. I like growth. Even though I kind of want to do this one. Let's see what happens when we remove the red tape. As unfortunate as it might be, the men of the commerce do have a point. How can any Welsh business keep up with an American or even an Irish business when they've had decades to establish themselves, whereas the Welsh business only had a matter of years? They've had the advantage in resources, in established wealth, and in simple momentum, while the Welsh have nothing in comparison. Welsh business needs an edge if they're going to be able to compete. 
When Wales has had a long and successful history of commerce and trade, and our companies and corporations are sitting upon an established a system, we can think about reinstating the, these protections. But for now, the unrestrained and unregulated growth will allow these small companies a head start they need. And while the unions may rattle sabers and bang pots together in protest, they will just about need to adjust through the reality of things until such a time that we'll be able to accommodate their desires once again. Now, I have a feeling we're going to lose more political power as well as some stability. But I'm maximizing construction already, so we can get two. And instead of this being built in 1966, we'll have it done in a little more than two years. Ah, yes, very good. Military funding. Long-term economics. I like that one. Even as the fate of Wales seems more and more incumbent on rancorous parliamentary debates, a good deal of Lewis's policies are still perked in back rooms. And as he grows older by the day, he may have less and less of say what is in what said policies are. Roderick Brown and Gwenford Evans, two chief architects of the Welsh economy, have been drafting up discussions to have with PM Lewis. Beyond the public short-term view of the assessment, the two men seem to be aiming for a pragmatic and stable road to economic growth, the kind that can last for decades. Should the, pre should the present problems be transcended, these talks will hopefully be remembered as key to a continually stable Wales. Is less more, maybe? Less for some, more for all, runs the headline of the front page of the local newspaper. Ah, see, I knew it would lose political power and stability. In a shocking reveal, the government has announced that the decision of deregulation has been made. A statement made by Plaid Simru, a spokesperson, stated the following. There are those who claim that deregulation will open up the way to exploitation of workers, but this is simply false. Rather, by removing the shackles that hold businesses back from prosperity, deregulation will open up the way towards a better future for all in Wales. While admittedly some workers' rights have been lost, the amount of those same workers in Wales as a whole stand to gain from the economic benefit of deregulation is well worth the loss. Protests have broken out in those several cities, including Cardiff. As workers take to the streets, some of those have resulted in violent clashes with the police, with many workers being taken into custody. Many Gulf MPs have denounced the controversial decision, with one going so far as calling it an obscenity and a threat to workers' rights everywhere. Gail Dawson frowns, putting down the Pipe family. Working in the mine was hard enough as it was, with the long hours and low pay, characteristic of manual labor jobs. With the regulation of certainty, it can only get harder, or work in yet less pay. And another event. No? Okay, well, keep going, guys, keep growing. We need all that growth, because we don't have that, 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 that much right there, so... Workers' protection slash. On all too familiar error, despair blew through the cities of Cardiff. Some workers wondered why they would ever catch a break, if they would ever. The realization that the government was going to cut down on the few protections they used to have hit, had hit hard. Many felt like they had been betrayed by the government, yet any attempt to quit, prevent their action would inevitably be futile. So they quickly uh, learned to accept the challenges and carry on with their lives, though such somber feelings were not shared with the men who owned the factories they worked in. They reveled in the news, knowing full well that the reforms would make them richer than ever before. As every big business owner in the country would likely inevitably capitalize on it. The government has earned their support, but at a great cost. Could the people forgive them for it? Does this or are this doesn't hurt too much anything? No. Cool. Cool. Even more construction. Oh, we still have two. Okay, that's fine. Hey, it's, it's almost less than two years now. We can only get 1.46 every day. Not bad. Wow. Wow. 23 percent growth. Wow. Don't want if we do. Spend, spend, spend. Slash, slash, slash. This is great. This is going to be great until we actually have to fight a war. <laughs> oh, man. Long-term economics, huh? Well, strategic theorem is going to be important. Let's go. I'm, there's no, no, no room for tanks, so prepared readout systems. Oh, yeah. Long-term economics? How about military funding? While largely undiscussed in the annual assessment, the question of military spending deserves to be examined, if not for budgetary concerns and simply to appease Julian K. O. Evans, always loudly using apocalyptic rhetoric to demand a stronger army. The facts must come before this charged rhetoric, for our brave men are not to be used as spawns pawns in some political game. Loyal, well-armed, and well-trained, our military nevertheless has gaps. Corruption is rife and could be solved depending on who you ask, with more money for better pay or cuts in investigations to reduce public money in their hands. Such as a general theme of the debate, all problems related to the military will be solved by either cutting or boosting its budget, but what are the problems our military exists to solve? Do they defeat the English? To be a lost line of defense in worst-case scenarios? Or perhaps they are the problem, as some leftists and unionists argue. A message from the Ministry. Good morning, gentlemen. Shall we begin? As that time of year again, time for the Ministry of Economics to give the report to the government. As you can see here, the speaker starts, motioning towards the graph. Coal exports have risen quite dramatically. We should start to see the positive effects of this on the rest of the economy soon. We predict this will cause employment and the coal industry to rise by between 7 and 9%. The overall positive effects of this, blah, 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 blah. As the speaker's dull voice drones on about the room, Bryce Davies wakes to a sharp jab to his side. You doze off again. Get it together, Dylan Reese, his fellow play member whispers. Huh? What I miss? What I miss? I have no idea how, uh, how pe Welsh people speak. I just know that the Welsh language is really, really crazy, and sometimes it's really, really long words. <laughs> That's the best way to describe it as an American. <laughs> oh, Nixon! Ooh, 
Interesting. No civil rights? Oh. I feel like I'm losing my mind while playing this. I think I lost my mind before I started playing this. But we're going to address the unions. Being such a small nation with such a large portion of our citizens and heavy labor work, it only makes sense that the local unions wield as much a great deal of power here than it does in other nations. This has been to the benefit of the workers, but it makes half the parliament nervous, especially when we pass or even consider a legislation that the unions may not be in favor of as such. It's common practice to hold a meeting with the unions following a session of the parliament, just to be sure. This time, the adjust will be pretty important. Given that we pass multiple very significant pieces of legislation one after the other, it's time to see if the unions aren't are happy with the changes we've made, or if they've earned their ire, or we've earned their ire, and we need to find a way to make sure to show it up to them some way, somehow. Oh, they're going to be pissed off. And that's okay. Can I spend more money? Yes, we can. We're barely making anything. That's not bad. I love this. As if they weren't already given enough. And as you may, you may well know, the Welsh military is woefully inadequate. The many threats that we face, especially the English menace, means that the military budget must be increased in order to properly defend the country. Saunders Lewis sighs warily, putting down the letter. Once again, the military is requesting more funding in order to protect against English aggression. There definitely is some merit to his request. A stronger military would deter any aggressive acts from neighboring England. However, the budget is rather high as it is, and that money could be spent in wells in other ways. Namely, reinvesting into the country by improving state services as better quality of schooling. Then there's a third, almost unspeakable option. Slash the military budget. You've just been at peace for almost 20 years, and there are many countries who are of the belief that, that too much of the government's limited resources are allocated towards a military that serves little purpose. We didn't need that money anyways. Ooh. Two reservist divisions will be mobilized for the foreseeable future. Oh, that's not bad. I kind of don't mind, like, getting more divisions, but it's best as it is. But, ooh, we're going to need more manpower. Some reservists will be demobilized. Uh huh. All right, so wait, we lose money. We eight, lose eight thousand manpower. <sighs> Better use somewhere else. Some reserves. Well, I mean, we can always make more divisions. It's going to be a few years, so we're just going to. I want more manpower and infantry equipment. Here, that's not the right call. But I do need more guns, so. Because we gotta make sure we make enough. We have enough divisions here. Actually, if I train all of you guys, we're not gonna have enough guns. But we do get a okayish amount of, you know, army XP. We need more army XP so we can make these guys at least ten combat with. Because when the English invade, I mean, they're just gonna come, just and just murder us all. So uh, let's grab some more of this. So we're in construction, more max batteries in the state is very nice. So yeah, there's probably one minus one twenty-five. Oh, we're still making more guns. We're gonna need some more anti-tank though as well. So that's not good. Alright, to hold talks with the Free Welsh Army, hold talks with the Milton Socialists. Well, the way it seems like we're going, uh, Black Arms trade increase, whatever. It doesn't seem like it makes a lot of sense for do us doing this, because we remove red tape, we cut welfare, so it makes more sense that we do hold talks with the Free Welsh Army, probably. It's time for a talk. The Free Welsh Army seems to grow ever more brazen by the day, and innocents are both their targets and are getting caught in the crossfire. This is not just horrific in its own right, but it's an affront to the rule of law and our own ability to keep the peace in Wales. The constant targeting of Englishmen within our borders, uh, and without threatens our peace with our neighbors, and it will forever hold back Wales if we don't do something about it. To, to just attack them would lead to open rebellion, and we can hardly afford what when our nation's existence is a, as as of yet so new. We are unfortunately in no position to make demands either, so we're going to need to negotiate with them. Underneath the banner of truce, we will find out what they want and what we can offer to get them to stop their military buildup and to stop their attacks. If evidently Kayo's appointment wasn't enough, and what more could these ingrates want? A meeting with the unions. Meetings between influential ministers have become a common occurrence over the past few weeks. The cabinet would arrive in a drab office where the PM would inevitably be waiting for them, making last-minute preparations before they enter the business of the day. This meeting, however, was to be different. Government ministers were not the only ones who would attend. Some of them were quietly shocked when the prime minister told them that he invited a group of representatives from several of the country's more powerful unions. Shortly after the ministers had been told of the imminent arrival of the unions, the representatives began to file in and quickly took their seats opposite the government. After they had all entered, the PM welcomed them and began to outline what the purpose of the talks would be. They were to discuss the actions of the government over the past few months. The Prime Minister made sure to remind them of all those presents of the legislation that his government had passed, sometimes going into painful amounts of detail. Ultimately, his lengthy address boiled down to one simple question, what did the unions think of the government? The Prime Minister waited the response, and they're going to be completely pissed off. And that's okay, I'm going to buy some guns. <laughs> oh, we have debt here. Oh, that's not good. Hey, equipment arrives. Great. Awesome. That actually really helps. Wow. Wow. If we can buy some anti-tank, I'll gladly buy some. The unions have been enraged. Why on earth do you think we would be happy with what you've done? You gosh darn dudes are ruining our lives. You could have helped us, but instead you just left us up to our necks in deep sheep, sheep poop. If this is all what you brought us here for, I don't see any point in saying. In saying or saying. 
The meeting did not continue for very long after that. It had not gone the way the Prime Minister had intended. He had at least hoped that they would remain neutral towards him. However, the Union representatives had made it abundantly clear to the government that they were just not disappointed, but were angry. With the relations with the unions in tatters, the governing will become a much harder task. Those in the government hope that they will not seek some form of vengeance. Though most have accepted that, this is incredibly unlikely. Uh, well, at least that's out of the way. I don't like this sinkhole debt, but you know what? Even if we debt, it doesn't matter. We literally have no debt interest on the debt. God, I could only dream of that. Oof. Why not? Keep training, guys. A hey, one army XP, nice. We're gonna get actually all those guns. Yeah, I'm tempted to get rid of what we have for guns and just buy more guns later on. How can we do this? What do we do this? Uh, or we just buy stuff. Training increases, cool. I mean, it's obviously not good for us, but whatever. And then just, oh, hold on, I, I don't want to read this ahead, I, we need to figure out what's going on here. So, played me to the WFA. After much consideration of the very ideals of Wales, so, well, some members of the government have decided to meet with the Free Welsh Army, led by Julian Cao, to discuss or deal with the leftists in the country. After the discussion, the meeting spot was chosen in the pub and carded. The Duff FWA asked the representatives from the play to dress in normal clothes and not the clothes that they would wear to a government procedure. Once they had arrived, an armed WFA, FWA member was standing on the inside of the pub. One of the representatives remarked that the whole pub seemed to be owned by the FWA, in which one of the FWA members replied to this and said that this pub and a few others were used in a safe house by the FWA, if they are on the run from the left, militias that roam Wales. After an hour of negotiations between the two parties, the FWA agreed to stop shooting up <laughs> Welsh police, ba police barracks and stop the firefights with the left militias. The FWA agreed on this as long as the government coalition agreed to move forward with the idea of Welsh nationalism and began to get rid of influence from the Anglos. The representatives from the government agreed to this opposition and the two parties left from the pub a few minutes after an agreement was reached. The next day, a small group of members from the government met to discuss the development of the FWA. After heated discussions with the more left-leaning members of the government, they decided they would honor their agreement and start to include more nationalist elements in the government. After the left-leaning members left in protest, the conversation switched to the raids and the left militias. An argument broke out in the group, but this had been quelled and the decision was reached. Raids would start on the left. This will guarantee Wales' future. Awesome. We got stability. Uh, so we can't arrest Kyle's men. Wait for this to all blow over? Nonsense! <laughs> the radical socialists from within the working class of Wales are a different kind of beast entirely as compared to the Free Welsh Army. While the Free Welsh might be rabid dogs, they are chained rabid dogs so long as Julian K.O. Evans is in our cabinet to make sure that the leash is in fact held. The socialists, on the other hand, are entirely unfettered, unbound, and free to cause havoc should they gain the strength to do so. This cannot stand. Dealing with this issue should also help keep the Free Welsh in line as Julian K.O. Evans was the first to suggest using police forces to disperse the socialist rioting. Emory Thomas is threatening drastic political action if we go through with this plan, but they can K.O. Evans, in turn, ensures us that such threats are simple, simple bluster, and that he can do little and less in his, if his precious riders were to be scattered to the wind. Let's hope he's correct. How's the budget doing? Nice. Cut it down, cut it down. One and a half GDP? Not bad. One and a half billion? One and a half GDP? Nice. And then we'll do educational matters. Out of all the duties and responsibilities of a nation, the one we have neglected the most in the early life of our nation has been educating the youth. At the time, it was understandable that we'd want to work to first establish a parliament, police force, armed force, and regulations of businesses and unions. But now we've established ourselves, and we need to revisit our scattered and incons inconsistent national education system. Some localities and provinces are simply handling education themselves with a smattering of private schools in some of the richer regions of Wales, complicating the picture even more. Simple disorganizations cause problems with educational standards in one part of Wales exceeding or being drastically beneath that of another part of Wales. We need to start corralling these public, local public schools and private institutions to start installing some kind of regulations or even state control of these institutions if necessary. More stability and authoritarian democracy don't mind if we do a fresh round of arrests. Isaac Palmer was walking through the streets of Cardiff. It was raining and the mood was miserable. He put up his umbrella and walked through the streets and the beeping car horns had been loud as he walked down the streets. He was on his way to meet the leader of a local union along with a newspaper owner as he was one of the leaders of Cardiff branch of the left militias that roam around the country. If you remember correctly, there hadn't been an attack on any one, any one of them for the past week by the FWA, so he was yeah, pretty content and happy. As he walked into the building where he'd been told to meet the union leader, there was no one there. Isaac was confused. He dropped his umbrella and opened his briefcase. Inside were many pamphlets about unions and leftism in general. However, below those papers was a pistol for protection against thugs of the FWA. He thought about getting the pistol out of the case, but decided against it. There are no armed FWA members all the way out here in Cardiff, he thought. As he briskly walked through the building, he found it abandoned. It was disappointed that the union leader bailed on him, and so, so he decided to walk back outside and continue his walk through Cardiff. Once he got outside, a light was shown in his face immediately. He stumbled 
around the ground outside before a forceful arm grabbed him by his arm and pinned it behind his back. Uh, it was those pigs, he thought. I have rights to be doing this currently. You have no reason to arrest me. He yelled at the officers who had been arresting him. Orders from the government. You militias have been at risk for far too long, Isaac exhaled, realizing that fighting was stupid. As he was led into a car by the constable, he wore or swore he noticed a member of the FWA standing next to the police. Those gosh darn free Welsh deuterinos. Nice. I'm going to play Wales again in some time. Uh, let's grab some support company, support company, support equipment. Hopefully we can actually get that. Thank you, because we'll need that in the future, probably. Only 125? What else are we going to spend our political power on, you know? Educational matters. Next generation of teachers. War support. Uh, I'll do this one. National grading. We have the control over the public education system and our influence in the previous private schools secured. The last remaining incoherency in the Welsh education system is how we grade students. There are a few... Uh, a few different ideas that are different provinces and schools have introduced, but it seems as though everyone agrees that we just need to stick with one, as the confusion has brought the region and time of education into question for colleges and employers alike. The process is simple, we'll just take the different ideas, everything from percentile grading to grading on a 20, to grading on a 100, to pass and fa fail versus letter grading, and to determine which serves well as the best. Every version has its supporters, but surprisingly unpartisan who supports them, I guess we have to do this in order. Gosh darn it. Education reforms. The education system according to the child's development. A place where any influence on a child may stay with them for their entire life. Is it any wonder that the Welsh government has begun to reform the system to in order to install values of Welsh independence? Though while the government cannot yet fully indoctrinate children through the system, and while English influences are still visible and prominent, the extended of this the extent of this influence dwindles by as the days go by. Books on English history and English folk still disappear from school library shelves. Slowly but surely, the English presence in Welsh schooling system lessons leaving many to wonder how long it will be before it disappears entirely. Wales' future is in our schools, but is it a Welsh future? Oh, so maybe we get the events to do this. Okay. We can decrease black arms market trading. Eh. I kind of don't mind it, so the matter of the Welsh language bill. The matter of the Welsh language bill was a fast approach in the Senate. It had been the government's works for some time by this point and by the most urgent nationalists of the National Front government. This bill was to be a culmination of what they have strived towards ever since independence. It was to be the very symbol of a truly independent Wales. But the bill was not without its opponents as it was introduced to the House of Objections were already being voiced from the Unionist government or members. Gulf members were also noticeably unenergetic with the bill. Seeming unaware of this, a Nationalist member continued to de deliver his proposition. Us nationalists have always been con seen conspiracies that seek to destroy the Welsh culture and tradition. It is with the essence of this vigilance against Welsh oppression that I commend this ban on the teaching of the English language in Welsh schools. We do this to preserve our language and make ourselves invulnerable to the foreign deceit and desires of our neighbors. Several Unionist members arose from the seats to put forward a rebuttal. One was chosen and glared down at the Nationalist MP as he launched into his counter-argument. I beg to move that this assembly asserts that the proposed bill is objectionable in principle and unfair and unworkable in practice. I, along with every other unionist member in this assembly, am of the belief that the problem it creates for peoples, teachers, and local governments will be far greater than the government is willing to let itself believe. The atmosphere of the assembly collapsed and rapidly became uncontrollable as both sides spat abuse towards one another. Scenes like these had never been seen before within the assembly, though it is unlikely that they would even be witnessed ever again. A term for the worse. Oh well. Whatever. We can't choose anything here. Mm, big sad. Big sad. Alright, the government six picks a side. Over the course of a dozen or so minutes, its initial turbulent reaction to the introdu introduction of the Welsh language bill began to partially die down. Ministers reserved their frustration as best they could. The Prime Minister had just been called to speak. He, along with the others could, of, his rest of his government, ministers, have been trying to remain as superficially impartial on the Welsh language bill before they can in an attempt to try and reconcile the Gulk and more hardline nationalists. However, that's not helped much for, to preserve unity in government, as both wings can continue to tear each other apart over the bill. The Prime Minister would not let his position on the matter reign unknown any longer. He could not bear to see his government constantly at odds with each other. He knew full well whether which side he would choose to help would likely triumph. But the losers would not take the defeat lightly. With this in mind, he stood before the assembly and prepared to reveal which side he had support. The hardliners or the gulk? The bill fails, huh? Next generation teachers, lessons. Oh, boy. Hmm. Welsh language? Hmm. Do we want... What? What, what is a gulk? Thirteen democracy. Mac. What the, what's it? Mac. Burgundian system. Johannes Jones. Oh, libertarian socialism. Play some rule. The independence. Uh, why not? Boost it up. Slash it down. ILP victory in Scotch elections. 
Art Armstrong, and I must lend my support to the statement made by a member regarding the vulnerability of our Welsh culture. Our revitalization of Welsh tradition should not be cast aside as we must be proud of our Welsh past and fight for our future. The Prime Minister, who returned to his seat amidst thunderous applause from the hardline nationals who had proposed the bill in the first place. They roared and reveled, the bashing their shoes against the floor, drowning out the unionists in the vulgar cacophony. The fact that this display glaringly breached assembly tradition did not seem to faze them. Members of the GOKA were most appalled by the Prime Minister's decision to support the bill. Even some left the chamber to display their disgust. Their discontent was apparent to all in the assembly. He was struggling to maintain his national front at, from this point onward, such as the cost of hardline support. Awesome. Oh, we have more debt. I don't like that. That's not awesome. I don't think it was Americans. Oh, those pesky Americans always going to war with somebody. Cut it down. Cut it down. No debt. Not in my whales. So when are we going to choose this stuff? Always false. The bill passes. In spite of the objections of the Gulf members of the government, the rest of the nationals have been held their ground and still intend to pass a bail once the assembly has reconvened. By now, news of the bills had started to spread across Wales alongside the news outrage had emerged. Largely, unionist parts of the country were practically up in arms over the fact that the government was willing to remove English from the national curriculum. However, this was not the concern of the Prime Minister. His job was to get the bill passed. Some better unionists were not going to stop him. But even the PM was still nervous about what, what the result might be, as he could not be sure of the true intentions of each of the members of his government. And if the bill failed, his whole government would be endangered. Knowing this, he only became more anxious as the vote drew nearer. His anxiousness would continue as he re-entered the chamber and sat down and began to await the results. It did not take long for the results to be declared, and as much to the Prime Minister's relief, the bill had passed in the narrowest of the margins. A few votes could have tipped the balance and avoided the chaos that was about to unfold. What have they done? Oh, we've created a giant mess. And if it's not a mess, why would we even want it? Oh, look at that. Support. Let's get more infantry equipment, because that would be really good. Ah, oh, so good. Republic response to the Language Act. In the wake of the passing of the Welsh Language Act, Wales has become rocked by mass protests and nationwide displays of civil disobedience. Clashes with the authorities have become worryingly, worryingly common, leaving the police force overstretched and close to a breaking point. The shocks from these riots have been felt inside the government, even the Prime Minister has noticed how upset most of the Welsh people have become. They want the Language Act removed, the act that the nationals have fought so hard to pra pass. The government is now at odds with its people, and the Prime Minister will not be able to turn a blind eye much longer. He will have to adjust the situation, though. He has not made up his mind on how he will do this. Removing the act to alleviate the pressure from the protesters, but to the detriment of the unity of the National Front. The government will have to make a decision on the act, though they fear that now that there is no correct option. Maybe they are right? Double down? We're going double down? We're going to see how bad the situation can get. Honestly, it, it makes a lot more sense, actually, to keep English in the language, just because you're so close. You're going to have so much trade, probably, with England. So, it just it doesn't make sense to remove it, but hey, you know what? I guess Welsh nationalist. I'm doing this for you, I suppose. <laughs> Protest spread. Doubling down has not improved the situation in the streets. The protests have swelled on size and ferocity. No city or town is safe. Discontent has spread into every corner of Wales. Clashes between unionists and the be beleaguered police forces are an, are an everyday occurrence everywhere. Yet both sides have become impatient with the government dis uh, dithering. The government's ineffectual attempts to preserve the national front have forced them to ne neglect the concerns of the public. They cannot block them out much longer. The situation has broken down past the point where the public or people can continue to be ignored. The government will finally have to find a way to calm down those protests before the situation becomes too gosh darn serious. Before it falls out of control, something's got to get done. Well, we'll see what happens. Are we going to get cooed? That sounds, like, that sounds crazy, but we might. Army Reserve training? Why not? We're going to need as much defense as possible against some English dudes. Oof. Battle lines are drawn. The brand new language bill is already turning into a pitch battle. K.O. Evans announced today in a fiery speech that will do everything in his power to pass the bill. We are a nation of Welshmen, he said, and that means we must fully cast off the shackles of Anglo tyranny, not allowing our children, our children, to be subjected to cultural violence. Welsh now, Welsh forever. The accusations of violence in a fly of the Unionists, as MP Nicholas Edwards calls Kyo a divisive Hitlerist who seeks to relegate all his enemies to the status of subhuman. We say no to fascism on our shores. As the debates continue, the language bills like will likely further fall further and further into the background as the battle lines divide nationalists from everyone else, whether they prefer the title of liberal, anti-fascist, or unionist. However, we can take solace in the fact that all this will be relegated to parliamentary debate, not street violence. What are we without civility? After we wait to march on Cardiff, all to all patriotic Welshmen, join us in the defense of our language and culture. We, the men of the Free Welsh Army, will not bow to unionist lies. The streets of Cardiff belong to us, nobody else, and we shall demonstrate this. Come with us as we, as we march in defense of Brother Julian Cayo's Welsh language bill. Simru and Bith. This is a leaflet circulated nationwide by the FWA and supporters. Despite unionist protests, we have little to fear from the ranks of the largely civil, decent group. Their leaders have repeatedly promised that they will remain peaceful, and Kyle's presence among them will certainly keep any rash actions from occurring. Thus, we have allowed their requests to march in the interest of open debate and expression. The rights of one man must not end where the fears of another begin. We are all Welsh at the end of the day. Nationalist posters cover Cardiff walls. Stand with Wales. Stand with the FWA. Join us for the march on Cardiff. 
fight unionist submission, and fight for the freedom of Wales. Follow Kayo's lead, stand for our language and people on the streets of Cardiff. No English in the streets, defend Cardiff, stand with the free Welsh army. Say no to the Anglo traders, join the march on Cardiff. Our streets have a past problem, or have a pest problem. Let's keep them clean, let's keep them Welsh. Hey Anglo, we know you, you, we all know your real masters. Examples of FWA posters in Cardiff in the lead up to the march collected by the Cardiff Anti-Fascist Club. It is their right to do so. And unionists aim to blanket Cardiff Wells. Stand for peace and unity, stand up against the FWA threats. Kayo wants to divide us now, showing we will never well stick together in Cardiff. Violence has no place on our streets, kick the Kayo cult out. All against the fascists or fascism. Cardiff Anti Fascist Club will call you to stand with your brothers and sisters, answer Kayo's provocations, keep fascists out of our streets. If the Hitlerists want to fight, they'll get one. Cardiff belongs to all of us. Posts are seen on the wall from the Lion's Den, a pub in East Cardiff known as a popular gathering point, place for uh, unionists. This is against the law. Opening salvos, Harry stood on the corner of Tower and Gleis, dozens of sturdy flyers in hand. He'd only been involved in the local peace club for a few months, but he already knew he was committed to the goals. A union with England made the most sense to him, child of a London-born mother who fled during the sea line. Even if he could not officially call himself a unionist, it was not his crime yet to support their aims, but the upcoming march had left him sleepless and sweating in the past few nights, and he wanted to do whatever he could if it meant Kayo and his slugs back down. Right now, that meant following Jerry's orders and giving flyers out to anyone who needed them. As the, worry, uh, the sack wore thin, Henry, or Harry, was prepared to report back to the club and maybe head over to the Lions Inn after. As he saw three young, clean-cut men approach, he prepared to finally empty his hand. He walked towards them, letting loose the same pitch he'd been repeating all day. You lads interested in... Before we could finish, the three men charged, shoving him down onto the pavement, calling him a traitor to communists. Harry tried to feebly defend himself as the boots landed upon his head, as the fists landed in his guts. As the men lifted him up, just a slam on the concrete once more. Was this it? Would he already be a martyr for the cause? As it turned out, this was not Henry's final day. Multiple passerbys tried to break up the group who managed to scramble away before anything else could happen. The next day, Harry would be celebrated for his commitment at the Peace Club meeting, alongside four other young members who had faced similar attacks. More than ever, he knew that standing up to the Nashville was a matter of life and death. They all teach those gosh darn English troublemakers. Ah, loss of stability. I just want more guns. Tension size. FWA begins their march. A few hours past midnight, Julian and Kale stood before a microphone in the ex excerpt of Diana's Powers. Calling on the thousands of FWA members to stand in defense of our culture, he then sanctioned the beginning of their march to the Cardiff Parliament with a call of Simru Ambeth. Despite a rhetoric by unionists and leftists, the march so far went off without interruptions. Cheers drowned out booze as a disciplined mass made their way to the city who's rattled, who rattled the morning with a car eye of, they will not replace us. As the narrow streets filled with the protesters, many in full militia fatigues, fears of violence are high. Some are said to be armed, though Kyle maintains that the protest is strictly a, a peaceful one. No word yet from the unionist camp who have been said to be organizing a counter-protest would have yet to appear. As the FWA draws closer to the parliament, the nation waits with bated breath. We all pray for a peaceful conclusion. Man, I just want to buy more guns. FWA blocked by a counter-protest. The image of unopposed nationalist march has been blown away. On intersections across Cardiff, the barricades have been thrown up by counter-protesters on many stripes. Staying true to earlier promises of protecting the streets, ostensibly organized by pro-union peace clubs, the counter-demonstrators are far from just gentle liberals. Various radical unions have come down to join in the struggle alongside militants waving communist flags and the black-clad members of the recently established Cardiff Anti-Fascist Club. Even erstwhile socialist MP Raymond Williams is said to be among their ranks. Uh, the confrontations at these barricades have so abruptly been relegated to the aggressive shouting matches. But with the passions being sky high, it was all it would take one spark is to blow it up. We can't preside over a bloodbath on our streets. Typically, our response to confrontations like this is a strong police presence. They're generally expected to show up and are skilled in non-violent tactics, so using them as peacekeepers seems like it can only de-escalate things. However, some of our advisors have pointed out that they are credible threats or credible reports of some demonstrators carrying projectiles and firearms, and the police may not be enough to keep order. Following this logic, they argue for a military presence to have these demonstrators back down. Clearly, de clearly demonstrating our firepower seems like it would make anyone think twice about violence. If we send in hammers, everything will end up looking like a nail. Peacekeepers, we are peacekeepers, we're not soldiers. Stay in the army, we can't take any chances. Hmm. What do we want? Police or the army? Do we want more government intervention or less? I don't know, I kind of like both. Let's escalate things with the army. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like such a bad idea. Sparks begin to fly. The past few hours made it seem inevitable, and now violence has arrived. The first brawls have spoken out or broken out among the barricades of Central Cardiff, with leaders on both sides immediately moving to blame their opponents and calling for peace. As their men make their way toward the center of the conflict, it seems plenty of remain time remains to defuse the situation. Reports indicate that the fights are only among the most radical sections of the protesters, and the civil majority wanting no part of it all. All we need to do is isolate the extremists, and we can save our streets from any further violence. These are and will remain largely peaceful protests. 
Well, Teddy, you were escalation. As we reach midday, things only seem to be degrading. Officers on the scene are reporting widespread violence, disproving previous claims about a radical minority. Furthermore, it seems that the protesters are no longer satisfied with fists alone and begin to look for any kind of makeshift weapon to aid in the fight. Bricks and stones are being hurled towards both sides, sending dozens of crashing into asphalt covered in blood. First gunshots have been heard, likely signaling the first deaths. We're on a precipice right now, and a complete explosion is just being a projectile away. Commissioner Carwin of the South Wales Police has rushed us in desperation demanding the authority to work with the Army and arrest any and all rioters, unprecedented in our history, but certainly not help critiques of play authoritarianism, but could help bring things to a decisive end. Our only other option is to carry out a targeted dismantlement, seizing on the most violent armed protesters while leaving any peaceful actors to reflect on what they're getting into. Do you know that we're currently facing illegal riots? We don't want war with the marchers. Let's disarm who we can and show the rest that we're on their side. Take- Oh god. Trying to t oh, take away other people's weapons is going to be- No, no. How can we escalate this more? Facing illegal riots? But let's just disarm who we can. Let's try that one. Downfall. The group thought it would be just them. A five-person or masked uh, contingent kicking down the door to the Senate and tearing it to shreds, taking down their whole heartily edifice as punishment for the government's crimes instead. As they called to take the building's hundreds charged in behind them. Angela, looking behind her, noticed a meager menagerie of types. A menagerie. Policemen uh, shading their uniforms, old women with pistols, young men with brass knuckles. As the crowd tore through the d building's diminutive windows and ornate doorways, the looting of the, place of the palace began. Statues were knocked down, paintings ripped apart, tables flipped over. Angela gestured to her friends who had traveled downstairs down a winding cement staircase. As it closed in, she whispered to them rumors of a hidden bunker where Lewis and his crewmates would be hiding. With the raising of her fist, Angela began the charge towards this alleged bunker. Hours later, when the whole Senate was ravaged to reveal hastily evacuated bunkers and smashed out windows with, still fresh with the blood of those poor sods trying to escape, Angela and her comrades from the anti-fascist club sat in the opulent banquet hall, taking just enough shots of the 300-year-old bourbon to loosen up, but not soften their edges. Hundreds still remained in the Senate, and one of the comrades began cracking up, saying that Wales really did belong to the people and not just fat pricks with bad tastes in art. That was when they started hearing sirens. How long had it been? How long had these radicals been... Occupying the halls of power. Once again, taking initiative, Angela caught on her comrades and anyone ne nearby to take up positions that had line of sight on different entryways. Minutes later, when the haphazard welcoming committee took up positions, the attack started. The dozens of reasoned or seasoned radicals hunkered down as tear gas flew inside, used tear gas to disperse them, as black clad commandos poured through the entrances, stormed the building, and infected protesters. Let's escalate this. It's, oh man, it's getting wild. This is it's getting a lot more interesting than I thought it would be. Capital under control. In a blink of an eye, Angela suddenly found herself in a bank world, or in a blank world. First, the white hot flash, the ringing in her ears, then the hiss of smoke, an absolute obfuscation of everything physically, physical nearby. She tried yelling to her comrades to anyone, but she could hardly move without feeling a harsh gravitational shove. So did she all she could do, lie down and wait for what was coming. An hour later, Angela found herself lined up on a wall next to one longtime ally, Dominic, and about a dozen strangers who'd followed them into the Senate. Angela still felt like her head was swimming, still felt like throbbing pain in her back when from the soldiers manhandled her. She tried turning to Dominic, trying to get a, a perspective from a fellow comrade. This attempt at communication was rapidly met by a boot to the face. With everyone on the wall restrained, or restrained, the, they, they could merely watch and shout as Angela wreathed in pain. Finally, the hulking commando in front of them spoke, not to those he had just restrained, but to his radio. Everything's under control, minimal casualties, the Senate has been cleared out, the military's on their way to pick them up until the police get their head, their poop together and process them. His deliberate terse pronunciation was quickly met with a reply. Wonderful, these criminals will be dealt with accordingly. Thank you for keeping order down there. Is this peace? At least the storm dissipates. The final hours of night... What was once a cacophony of chaos now became an ir eerily silent place. The evidence of what took place earlier in the day was everywhere, well, but one would not be remiss to assume everything had been taken appropriately taken care of. Yes, there were really shattered windows and burnt up businesses, but those edifices could be rebuilt. The true losses of such violent mo moments were far and few between. The occasional FWA soldier could be found lying dead in an alleyway, multiple gunshots to the torso. Perhaps a few college students could be found as well, still wearing the bandanas they brought to hide their identity. However, Few of the state's agents were to be found, for the police firemen, and this was a resounding success. They could go home and celebrate the victory, the non-violent conclusion to the Cardiff March. For those in the halls of power, this could not have ended better. As yet, as always, it succeeded on the backs of the young and desperate, leaving dozens of families to bury the children. Was well, this not the best we could have hoped for? A national tragedy, this whole affair has been a disaster. May the future settle better. I thought we were just focused on education. What happened to this stuff? <laughs> oh my goodness. Can we get through at least one more focus before we maybe end the episode here? Maybe I didn't choose the right path. Maybe I did. Maybe I didn't. I have no idea. I'm just here having a good time, so. 
And we'll finish this with Whispers from the Miners. Work in the mines with the voils is tough. Not everyone was cut out for labor under the earth, and dark where dust gradually fills your lungs. That is the way it's always been, and many believe that this is the way it'll continue. But at least they have work. Even on a life in the pits is better than one on the streets. Yet after another day of sweltering toil in the gloomy pits, miners began emerging in the light. They carried out their usual carts of coal and lung full of suit. However, something ominous emerged from the depths with them. It started as a creaking trickle, though it has quickly quickly become unavoidable. The mines are running out of coal. These reports were unconfirmed, as if they were right, it would spell disaster for the Welsh economy. The government would be imperiled. God only knows how far Wales would deteriorate if news of this crisis got out, but the whispers are far too absurd to be true. How can we run out of coal? But why would the miners lie about such a thing? It cannot be true, could it? But regardless, I think this video's gone on long enough. But how about one more focus? Investigate the mines. With the rise of the recent news from the miners, we must investigate for ourselves. Simply put, the government just wishes not to believe the miners. These rumors are preposterous, too. But if true, the situation would, would follow would be very serious indeed. So we shall see for ourselves the validity of these claims, for we shall also suspend our disbelief and start an investigation. Soon these fears will be put to an end, and we can move on with more important matters. Surely the miners cannot be right. But regardless, if you enjoyed this video, consider leaving a like, subscribe if you're new. Hey, check out my Discord link in the description below if you haven't already. And I'll catch you tomorrow as we have a good time with whales. Thanks for watching. Have a tremendous, tremendous rest of your day.